it's hard to deny that there's something immensely alluring and timeless about film photography. The way it softens highlights and blurs detail, emphasizes light contrast, or introduces color casts. Personally, I think one of the greatest benefits of film photography is the thoughtfulness and intentionality that comes from knowing there's a limited amount of shots to be taken, and the lens through which it guides you to look at the world. For my own workflow, I've generally found digital photography to be more functional, since I'm frequently recording videos. However, the aesthetic appeal of film is something I've been incorporating into my own work. Over the past five years, I've been refining my photo editing to borrow elements from film photography, infusing it with my personal and color-rich style. In this video, I'll guide you through my workflow to achieve this aesthetic and provide you with a preset I use as a base on all my photos. All right, so you're gonna to wanna to start by opening up Lightroom. Right on the left-hand tab here by Presets, you are going to click Import Presets. You're gonna to go to the Gathering Blue preset that you've downloaded and import it right here. And then it should import under your preset listing. You can choose where to categorize it here. And we can apply the Gathering Blue preset. And as you can see in this case, personally, I find this image a bit overexposed, but that's why we'll navigate to the right hand side. And as you see, there's certain parameters that have not been altered, and these are because they are left there for you to manipulate yourself. So we're gonna start with our exposure. And personally, I like to crank down my exposure quite heavily. There we go. It creates a nice balance between the darker areas and the highlights, and we're gonna go and finesse that with, personally, I like to pull up the highlights and then bring down the whites, pull down the bracks a bit to create even more depth in the dark areas, and shadows I tend to bring up a tiny bit to bring back some of that detail uh, in the darker areas. We can also adjust the contrast. I tend to push it a bit harder, that's why I've left a preset here, but if the image is very sunny, you'll likely want to bring that back. In this case though, it's a very foggy day, lacking contrast, so could even crank it a tiny bit more if we want to. Finally, you'll want to perhaps adjust the temperature and tint. So in this case, I think we're pushing a bit warm, but I really like what it's doing to this building and to the reflection here. We have a lot of yellows and greens. I find that quite pleasant in this image. So let's see what pushing into the blue will do. That cleans up the yellows, but I think it removes some of the fantasy of this image. So I think I'm gonna bring it back a tiny bit and we're gonna let it sit somewhere in the middle. Same with the greens, let's see what happens. The lake turns to a swamp and if we pull it back too much, hmm, actually gives it some nice clarity when we enter into the more pink. Now I think we've pushed it too far, but I think somewhere sitting around here is really good. So that's actually where we had it before. So. I guess it was a good place to start. And that's about it. You can go in and obviously modify and add more saturation or vibrance, but this is a very good starting place once you've adjusted just these parameters. If you want to push the film look to a larger degree, you can obviously pump the grain or add some vignette. Although in my case, I tend to add a reverse vignette. I like the way it clears up the entirety of the image. So, Let's jump into another one so we can get an example of um, maybe something a bit darker with more contrast. So let's go here to this image. This is a really good example because you have some light in the top corner, very dark scene on the left with some light in the background. So let us do the same thing we did before. We're gonna copy the transformation healing and crop, copy that over and then we are gonna proceed to reset the image and paste. So blank slate, apply the gathering blue reset. In this case, we have quite a dark image. So I think we're gonna push the exposure a tiny bit here. We don't wanna blow out the background there or the light. So I think just about 0.3 should be good. And here we're actually gonna pull up the shadows a tiny bit 
pull up the highlights and then bring back the whites. There we go. Blacks are sitting pretty well right here. If anything, we might give them a tiny bit of a boost. And this is a very blue. Um, so I think we might try and bring up the warmth to give more of that sunset feel. We still want to keep that blue in the shadows, but I think pushing the warmth will be a nice touch. And then the tint as well, I think can be a bit more pink, but only so gently. Now we're getting a nice glow and feel to the image. Let's add some more grain just to give it that characteristic. And I really like what that's doing here now. So it's just, you know, one minute of adjustment with this preset in almost all my images, I tend to get very close to the result I want in a short period of time. So at this point, I'm going to show you how I went about achieving a preset like Gathering Blue. So you can maybe create your own that you can use as the basis for a lot of your editing. And frankly, I don't expect you necessarily to get as much out of the Gathering Blue preset as I do, since I'm the one who made it. Part of the joy of using it is knowing that it's perfectly tuned to my particular tastes. So I hope that at least serves as a launching pad for you to create your own. And hopefully the tutorial that I'm about to give you now will give you further guidance on how to create something that has a filmic style while maintaining some of your own personality in the image. All right, so let us clean the slate. Copying, healing, cropping, and transforming. So let's reset this. We're gonna paste, amazing. All right, let's start by getting the exposure approximated to the right spot, as well as some contrast in the image just to get things working a bit for us. There we go, amazing. I'm gonna leave the highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks for the moment, because we'll get to those a bit later, and I find at the end of the day, they're not the determining factors of the quality of the photo, and they should be customized to the particular photo in question. First, we're gonna tackle the texture clarity and dehaze. Already here, we're doing some of the heavy lifting when it comes to getting that film look. So the dehaze is actually gonna introduce a lot of diffusion into this image, which gives sort of that hazy, as dehaze implies, look to the image. So if you push it to the right, we're gonna clear it up, but if we push it to the left, we're gonna, we're gonna create more diffusion. This image already has quite a bit, but I'm still gonna put some there. Clarity, I personally like to pull to the left. It gives much more of a painterly aesthetic. It softens up the image. We don't want to over-exaggerate it, but in the other direction, we get a very harsh digital look. So I'll tend to pull this about 15 to 20 to the left. Texture is to taste. If you want more sharpness in the image, I highly recommend pulling it to the right. If you want to loosen up the sharpness, you can pull it to the left. This image can actually do with a bit of sharpness, so we're gonna pull it to the right. So for the curve, we're gonna start with a traditional S curve to add contrast in the center, but then we're gonna do some personal modifications to it. So pulling this down to deepen the shadows and add contrast, already you can see how much the image is clearing up. You can pull up the tail end just a tiny bit if you'd like to pull up some light into the blacks. I lately have been keeping this low, but I know a lot of film emulations will have more light in the shadows, so that helps recreate this sort of feel. Just be careful not to overdo it, it becomes quickly obvious. Then we're gonna keep this pulled up, but we're actually gonna pull down the highlights ever so slightly to shift the contrast a bit to the higher end here. Just as a side note, I tend to think of the tone curve, not as an exposure changing tool, but rather a contrast changing tool. So when the curve is steeper, we've introduced more contrast. When the curve is more flat or shallow, we are lessening the contrast. There we go. I think we're living in a really good spot. Important part here is to pull it ever so gently in the directions. Before touching color, I think we're gonna wrap up with a bit more elements that relate to the lighting of the image. So that would include stuff like the post crop vignette, which is a stylistic choice. I think this one has enough already. And if anything, I think I'm gonna pull these corners up in lightness so we get more of the image and it's not so closed off. So we're gonna pull that up. There we go, freeing up the corners. 
And if you've done that and you've lined up the image, you then actually introduce another vignette, which is more strategic rather than the one introduced naturally by my lens. And then let's pump this grain into here. There we go. Put a bit less. Awesome, this is looking really good. We're lacking some color, but that's what we're gonna tackle next. As a strategy, I tend to push vibrance first and then determine saturation. So we're going to get the vibrance to a point where we feel like it's satisfactory. This is basically pulling up the saturation with preference towards colors that are less saturated. So it creates a more normalized or balanced saturation than saturation bar would because this pulls out everything equally. So we can pull that up a bit as well. Now we're getting a nice balance of all the colors here. Perfect. So now that we've color in the image, we can start to manipulate um, the, the subtleties of the tones of the image. So let's start with the temperature because that will highly influence the rest of our color choices. It's feeling a bit warm here, but I think actually cooling it down gives a nice look to the water somewhere around here. And I think the pink and green was sitting kind of nicely, but perhaps, yeah, just a bit more green in the image, just ever so slightly. That's looking good to me. A big aspect of film photography is that it introduces color casts. So that's what we're gonna start doing with a bit of this color grading wheels. In the shadows, I really enjoy introducing some red tones. I think it really richens the image, as well as often I bring it back down to bring a bit more contrast. The midtones, I think I generally like a green or yellowish look. I think a green suits this one really well. And this one I tend to bring up just a tiny bit. And in the highlights, I tend to like a pink or purple. Oh, that's really doing nice things to the water there, somewhere in the blue-purple range there. And we can push that up just a tiny bit. There we go. If you ever want to compare to before, you can always use the backslash, and I'll show you what the image was like before. If we also want to compare to where we were previously, what we can do is we can go to the History tab, and we can copy where we are and copy history step settings to before. So that means we can track what we have done moving forward. If you ever wanna save a copy of your current edit, you can add it as a snapshot here. As you can see, I am a big fan of this strategy. It helps me understand how I've moved through the image. So we'll check back on that in a second once we've edited the photo further. In terms of detail, this will be a personal preference, so I'll leave that up to you in your edit. Can close some of these other ones out. There we go. And we're gonna hit the calibration. My preference is generally to pull green into the shadows ever so slightly, although you can push the pink. It just feels like it bleeds through the whole image, so I like green as a cast. I'll tend to push the reds to the left, green to the right. Helpful to see it in its maximal state to understand its true effects and then push the blue to the left. So that's just my preference. It tends to emphasize more of the blue-orange contrast rather than the yellow-purple contrast. We can get into the minutia of the hue, saturation, and luminance, but I'd rather just give you a couple guidelines because it'll really depend on the photo. First guideline is to not manipulate this too much. It becomes quickly obvious that you're manipulating colors, and I find it is very, very difficult to change these drastically when you're dealing with skin tones, especially the top three ranges here. So reds, I'll pull a bit to the left, not too much. Same with orange, yellow. I really like what it does to the deep greens. We'll do the same thing on this one here. Aqua, it becomes more teal. This is a very strong choice, or we can get a deep blue actually in this one. I think the depth of the blue is really nice. I think we'll push that on this one here. And then purple and magenta often aren't present in photos, but so for that reason, I tend to leave them quite close to where they initially started. The rule of thumb for the next two is that you can have colors that are saturated and you can have colors that are luminant, but you cannot have both. So the goal here is to make sure that you balance these factors. Um, this image doesn't have too much red, it has a bit of orange. We're actually gonna increase that and then reduce the luminance. 
here, let's reveal all of them because they'll make this a bit easier. So we want to make sure that when we change the slider in one direction, we change it in the opposite direction on the other one. We're going to increase the uh, the luminance of the yellow. There we go, make a nice pop and reduce the saturation. Green, we're going to increase the saturation and reduce the luminance. I think we want a nice deep blue here, so we're going to increase the saturation and decrease the luminance, same with the next bar here, and the next two we're gonna leave as is. There you go. As a finishing touch, I tend to like to put one of the profiles that you'll find at the very bottom here called Vintage. I find they just push the image right where they need to be. This one will introduce a lot of contrast and not change the colors, while all the others have their own distinctive color style. I am a big fan of eight, I use it a lot, but in this case, 10 or actually four is doing a lot for me. Whereas one would make for a beautiful, beautiful contrasted image, but I really like what this is doing. The key to all these is to be subtle, introduce just a bit of it. We'll leave it around at 30. Since it's reducing quite a bit of the contrast, we're gonna push that back in there. There we go and adjust the highlights. For nice roll off in the top end, I like to push the highlights while bringing down the whites. We're gonna reduce the blacks here and maybe pull up a bit of the detail in the shadow. So I'm just gonna do a back and forth now before and after for what we had. So that's before we started doing the color corrections as well as the final touches of the luminance in the highlight shadows, whites and blacks. And as you can see, we have a much richer, denser photo here than before. So we're introducing that strong saturation that I tend to like in my images, as well as getting this very hazy and gentle filmic look. I think this could even afford a bit more grain here. And if we now compare it to my Gathering Blue preset, this is what we have versus what we resulted with here. So personally, I think I still enjoy my Gathering Blue preset a bit more. It has more of a whimsical, otherworldly look to it, but this one has a really nice quality as well. I think I went a bit harsher on the reds in the shadows, and I reduced the contrast as well, so the difference is not as harsh between the shadows and the light areas. So what I would generally do at this point is I could copy this over and apply it to a new photo and see if it works there as well, or I can restart the process from scratch for each photo. Since I've done this now for years, I find that Gathering Blue is such a good launching point for some of these stylistic choices that even if I want something else out of the image, I will start with Gathering Blue as my base. I've been using it now for a year and it is the only one I use. I think that having a lot of presets can be fun, but having one generalizable one from which you launch brings a consistency to the aesthetic of my photography and makes my editing process a lot simpler. I hope this video has been useful to you and that it gives you a better understanding of how to achieve a film photography inspired look. Of course, the only way to truly achieve a film look is by shooting film. But I do think that the attempt to emulate film isn't anything to look down at. If anything, it's a sign that our generation is still attached to it, that it still holds immense value and meaning. You can download my Gathering Blue preset at the link below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.